Hi, and welcome to the first of a series of industry insights of using vision as a sensor in industrial settings, brought to you by AD Link and Intel. So we're here for the 2020 Vision Hack, uh, which is on Hacker Earth, as you can see on the scrolling bar there. Um, we have uh, Daniel Collins, um, Bridget Martin, Daniel Homeland, and of course, Raymond Lowe from Intel. Hi, guys. Hello. So, so uh, why are we here? Uh, we've got the 2020 Vision Hack looking to uh, use vision as a sensor to solve um, problems. And to give you some insight on that, the guys are going to share some use cases that they've experienced um, to sort of help get through that thought process. Um, so uh, let's have a look at the themes, um, and then we'll uh, move on to some of the use cases with this. Let's take a look at the computer vision themes for the 2020 Vision Hack. Manufacturers leverage powerful, real-time data from the IoT to increase uptime, perform preventative maintenance, enhance productivity, improve mobile accessibility, and a host of other benefits, like fault detection and enabling higher quality production and quality inspection. Distribution businesses have requirements for asset management, business process efficiencies, and new business models. Considerations like warehouse management, tracking and tracing assets in real time, security and transparency, monitoring asset movement within and around the facility to prevent theft or the misplacement of goods. Workplace safety. Thousands of workers die in industrial accidents each year in the world and a huge amount suffer from non-fatal work-related injuries. Workers, employers and insurance companies collectively face billions of dollars of direct and indirect costs due to industrial accidents and individuals suffer unnecessarily. For example, think about personal protective equipment, PPE detection. Ensure people are wearing the correct equipment for hazardous environments. Fall detection. Enable identification and notification systems when workers experience injury or equipment is damaged. The energy sector is adopting the use of computer vision to enable smarter, automated and more effective sensor data collection. Actionable data available when and where it needs to be. Example uses are wind energy producers identifying maintenance such as dirt accumulation on wind turbines, dead insects and cracks in foundations or towers. In mines, automatic detection of anomalies in mines, for example leaks, fires, smoke, or even production blocks. So they're the things that we're going to be looking at in regards to uh, for the uh, 2020 vision hack. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Daniel Collins from AD Link. Hi Daniel. Hey, Paul, how are I'm you doing? Good, thanks. Um, so I've, I've worked with Daniel for, for nearly two years now, and we've worked on a number of um, uh, solutions for, um, using vision as a sensor. We're also very pleased to have Bridget Martin from Intel. Hi, Bridget. Hey, Paul. Hey. And we've got Daniel Homeland as well. Um, Bridget, would you like to uh, just introduce yourself um, and your role at, at, at Intel? Yeah. So I'm Bridget Martin. I am in our Internet of Things group specifically in our industrial solutions division. And I lead our industrial AI and analytics. So I'm very familiar with uh, vision as well as time series analytics in uh, different things that you described earlier. Brilliant, thank you. And Daniel, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Paul. Brilliant, and Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself and your role at Intel as well? Sure, my name is Daniel Homland. I am in, in the Internet of Things group as well in developer experience. My job is to build demos, do conference talks, and otherwise teach uh, about Intel products. Brilliant. And I'm I've sure... seen you before. I've seen you before, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> How long have you been working for Intel again? Uh, about 10 years. That's right. I've seen you many times then. <laughs> and of course, we have Mr. Raymond Lowe, um, my co-presenter. How are you doing, Raymond? Oh, I'm good. You've gone black. Don't worry. Black because special effects don't worry about it. come back. One, two, three. There we go. Lights up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm doing great today. Almost Christmas. How's everyone? Yeah, um, nearly got all the presents wrapped. <laughs> uh, good. But I've seen a lot of submissions so far, and I would like to thank a lot of participants for the last challenge or the mini challenge that we talked about last time. And it's still happening, so make sure you come and join us. That's right. We've got over 500 um, registrations now. Uh, we've already got nine um, submissions, and um, we've we've certainly had some great activity across social um, for the uh, neural stick to win a neural stick. Um, please do um, check out Hacker Earth website and find out how you can win that and watch the previous episode 
um, of uh, our little series here of live streams where Raymond takes you through um, a tutorial on using OpenVINO, a little challenge there for you to then share socially to win an Intel Neural Stick. There's a hundred of them to be won there. And I believe that closes on the 30th of December. Is that right, Raymond? Yeah, end of the month. And I see people post a lot of cats, panda, snakes. I don't Test know what else I saw. Tesla car was funny. It's a beach yeah. wagon, it says. <laughs> okay, whatever. It worked. Uh, but yeah, so what's happening today, Paul? You want to quickly go through everything? Yeah, sure. So we're, go we're going to have a chat with uh, the, the two Daniels and Bridget um, and hear about some use cases um, in distribution and worker safety uh, just to help everybody get um, the thought process going on, the kind of problems and what vision can be used for um, as a sensor. So, Mr. Collins, hi, how are you? Doing very well, thank you. Good, good. Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself in, in your role, Daily Link? Sure. Uh, at, at AD Link, if you're not aware, AD stands for Analog to Digital Link. Uh, my team and I have been uh, attempting to take anything that's analog and turning it into digital data that you can use to optimize your business. Uh, so machine vision is a great example of a technology that can turn something as analog as a cardboard box into a digital piece of data that you can use to uh, optimize logistics, traceability, uh, quality inspection, things of that nature. Right. So, could you could you touch a little bit further on one on, on one of those um, in in the distribution space? Sure. Um, do we have a, a a video to play? Or okay, great. So, so this is uh, a great example of uh, the two types of machine vision. Um, that I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on a bit. Uh, one is rules-based, right, where you have a, essentially a library of um, images that uh, the system understands. Uh, there's a camera overhead uh, that's actually reading the barcodes on each of uh, the boxes as they're placed on the pallet. Uh, and then there's also a machine vision or an AI model that's running that's looking for boxes, measuring their shape and size, uh, identifying whether or not they do have a barcode on them or not. The use case is uh, really based on how to optimize the palletization process, which today is still a very manual process, especially for uh, high mix orders where you have all sorts of different package sizes, uh, package shapes, maybe you have bags and buckets. Uh, things that uh, a robot would really struggle to load effectively onto a pallet. It turns out that humans are much better at playing this game of Tetris. Uh, typically, uh, a pallet uh, tizer or a, a pallet loader uh, would be using a handheld barcode scanner, uh, which isn't very um, you know, er ergonomically friendly. So it's difficult to carry a bunch of packages and then also your barcode scanner and place them onto a pallet. Uh, and then the barcode scanner is inherently flawed. It, it's not smart, right? It, it's going to read anything you put in front of it. And if you and I have been loading packages for, you know, five, 10 years, we're smarter than our hand scanner. So if the hand scanner doesn't scan and we place a package on a pallet and we think it's correct, then, you know, hey, maybe it is. And we won't find out until our customer calls us and says, hey, uh, you know, you forgot to add this uh, to my order, mm -hmm. to which we have to rush ship something to, you know, make up for that. It's rare that your customer would call you and say, oh, you know, you sent too many of these, but that also happens. And that's also a cost. Yep. So using machine vision makes the palletization process much more friendly. And the camera that's mounted overhead of the pallet again, is determining if the package actually belongs on that pallet, and it's uh, triggering a uh, light cue uh, that floods the entire pallet with either a red light or a green light, depending on whether uh, the package actually belongs there or not. And this increases order accuracy, and, and some of our clients have coined this as uh, something called pallet profitability. So every day they are, their management team can go back and look at the accuracy of each of their pallets and determine the profitability of that day, which is extremely valuable uh, from a uh, distribution process perspective. 
So, so there's there's huge benefits there, isn't it? There's the, there's the efficiency, there's new commercial models, um, all from being able to identify a box and and then being able to see its label and then being able to connect with the inventory as well. So, um, you know, when we've when we've uh, worked on projects and stuff, you know, le leveraging the edge computing side of it as well with the amount of data um, that flows is, is a really key asset as well um, to the ecosystem working efficiently and being able to connect into those um, those systems as well. So how can those types of solutions um, like you have with um, like a smart pallet, how, how can they evolve uh, with a customer as well? Because, you know, with um, traditionally with a, a temperature sensor, it takes temperature. Um, with a camera, you, you open up to a wealth of information, aren't you? Uh, I mean, that's right. That's actually how we got here in the first place. Um, you know, initially we were looking for packages that had fallen off of a conveyor system and using cameras mounted overhead, we're identifying lost packages. And from there, we realized there are so many other aspects where packages and items, it really doesn't matter what it is. It could be a, you know, a case of uh, your favorite soda. Uh, they just end up in the wrong place. And, you know, right now, without machine vision, we're relying on, you know, our, the, the, the humans who work and operate in that uh, space to identify these problems. And the, the, pro the issue with that is they also have their day job to deal with. And so it's, it's not always at top of mind. So it, it, this is really, you know, taking machine vision and aiding uh, human-led uh, uh, roles, right? We're not necessarily replacing them. We're using machine vision to allow humans to do their job better, which is also really important to understand. I think a lot of folks think of robotics and machine vision as replacing people. Uh, but what we've found is it really enhances and makes folks better at their jobs. Yeah, and I think that's what one of the really exciting things about is 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 also one of the things that um, to clarify um, with the market is that you know the machines aren't replacing; they're enabling us to be more efficient as technology has a history of doing. You know, um, old roles may change, but it enables people to have more a, a better role and a more job satisfaction. Um, Bridget, how uh, how how have you guys found things at um, Intel? What kind of projects have you worked on? Very, very similar to, to what Daniel was saying, uh, and in particular, kind of that last point as far as uh, machine vision and um, cameras now being in, in particular, the manufacturing space, really enabling uh, the factory and the factory operators, the workers with the factory, um, to be able to focus on that day job I described it. Um, and I think it, yeah, we've got a great example here. Um, when I think about distribution, and again, because I, I focus very much on the manufacturing and industrial space, to me, the, that uh, logistics and tracking and tracing starts um, on the factory floor. And so being able to place cameras throughout the factory, uh, where even, you know, kind of this tops down look, still providing privacy, you know, for those factory operators, enables that tracking and tracing to start on that factory floor so that you can uh, rack your inventory pieces as they're going from uh, the initial raw materials through the different stages of a manufacturing process to where they get to uh, that scenario that, that Daniel was showing earlier where they're packaging and palletizing uh, the, the product. So being able to essentially um, from uh, logistics and tracing uh, that much earlier in the in the supply chain down into the manufacturing is extremely valuable. Yeah, and it, I mean, again, it just shows that expansion of um, using the cameras um, in in the, uh, the the manufacturing distribution space. Mm -hmm. um, just you know, the possibilities are endless, and the, there's mm -hmm. there's so many things in regards to the objects, but also the people as well. Would you agree? That's completely right. Um, you know, being able to, uh, you know, I know we're going to talk about worker safety here in a minute, and, and ergonomics is a huge part about that. When you have um, people working in a factory and working with tools and equipment and things, being able to provide them that guidance on, um, you know, where they can place uh, or, can, or should place their, their arms and hands in, in order to be more ergonomic so it's better for their overall body and posture um, is a huge advantage. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, t t t t uh, sorry, touching on to that, Mr. Collins, um, as, as we were touching on there about worker safety as well um, within this workspace, um, I believe you, you and the team worked on one with uh, AD Link. 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, we we have done uh, quite a few different worker safety based uh, uh, solutions. This one, obviously, uh, this this human is is not moving that fast in real life. This video is a bit sped up. But uh, what you're actually seeing here is a, a fuel truck uh, that uh, has arrived. And there are all sorts of safety issues with this. The first being that the truck may roll. Uh, so the, the actual camera uh, and machine vision system that's running right now is looking at all sorts of different factors. The first is, you know, is this truck stationary? And if not, we need to alert someone immediately. We need to alert that driver. The second is looking for uh, the location of the humans. There are different zone uh, breach areas that we don't want them in during this refueling process, especially when the fuel truck is hooked up. That's extremely important for them to understand. We also wanna make sure that they're taking proper uh, safety measures uh, uh, that are required during the refueling process. For example, making sure that cones, you know, are at each of the four corners of the truck, making sure that the, uh, the humans that are doing the refueling are wearing their proper PPE. All of this can be done with machine vision. So, yes, it's important to have a supervisor walk out and make sure things are going on, but that, that's not always the case. And so if we can get immediate alerts, alerts, immediate feedback about, um, you know, mistakes that are being made, we can avoid really injuries, which is the, the primary objective of using uh, really any solution uh, to aid in, in worker safety. Yeah, so, so it's sort of like one of the things that resonates me with the worker safety side of things. I mean, which is, you know, let's be honest, we've seen so many in regards to worker safety we're under PPE with, with uh, COVID as we're, we're currently all going through as a global pandemic, um, that there's been some, some very common use cases for it, you know, going into supermarkets, counting people, making sure they're wearing the masks, which here in the UK I've noticed um, being really heavily implemented over the past couple of months, um, and quite rightly so with the new wave that we've got coming through. Um, but interestingly as well, it creates sort of accountability as well that, you know, if, if somebody isn't wearing the correct equipment and they or they go into an unsafe zone then you know that image can be logged you know not everything can be recorded if we recorded everything 24 hours a day seven days a week you know year after year after year we need really big data centers let's be honest um but um being able to take those images and log and retrain people you know it's not about um, getting rid of people it's about educating people to to learn from mistakes um at the, uh, Daniel Holmland, how, how have you found this type of area? So I, I've found that these are amazing use cases that have been enabled. And if I could just share my screen really quickly, I want to go through some of the ways that we enable developers to um, do these use cases or create these use cases. So can you see my screen right now? I'm just about to add it. There we go. We go. All right. So the, the first thing that I want to note here is that uh, when you're building use cases like this, oftentimes companies have different requirements and you can come at it from a variety of different points of view. Uh, right now there's TensorFlow, Cafe, MXNet, Onyx, all sorts of technologies which are enabling these computer vision applications. And OpenVINO, the Intel toolkit for computer vision, supports a large variety of them. The second thing that I want to say here is that we also work with a large variety of pre-existing libraries that are out there. Everything from OpenCV to having different types of workbenches and tools and, and model zoos. So there's a large ecosystem of software that is surrounding this. And then lastly, I want to show that not only are we working with uh, our hardware partners and OEMs, but we're enabling them to deliver different types of hardware accelerated hardware, low power hardware um, on CPUs, GPUs, uh, dedicated vision units. So this is really a software ecosystem that is um, full and complete and enables people that have pre-existing conditions in terms of their software development process to quickly get the types of applications that we just saw enabled. I think that's, I think that's um, one of the great things, isn't it, about that um, speed to deployment and building the models and having the right tools and choosing the right tools. Um, 
uh, and and making sure that they've got the hardware that's got enough power to to run things through depend on the intensity of the connect connectivity as well and you know with with my product Visi AI which um, the uh, phase two winners will receive one off to build their prototype on which includes the AD link edge software as well so you know utilizing the everything from OpenVINO and then taking that data output and then being able to deliver it uh, to Node-RED we have on there as standard um, so you can very quickly create the reactions so you can really build a prototype quite quickly and easily with it um, so uh, but Bridget do you, do you have any other use cases you'd, you think is quite relevant for people to hear about? Well, let's talk a bit about, uh, you know, one of the things, Paul, you were saying is, uh, you know, being able to, to help augment and, uh, you know, show if somebody's going into an unsafe zone and logging that. But wouldn't it be cool if we could also uh, help manipulate the manufacturing space in order to better enable those factory floor operators? So pairing, starting to pair um, computer vision with the hardware and equipment that's on the factory floor as well. For example, being able to control robotics and doing some of the collaborative robotics type efforts where if someone were to walk into a potentially unsafe zone, what happens today is that robotic arm just completely shuts down. Right. It yep. goes into a functional safety um, uh, 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 process loop and has to actually be manually um, reset, uh, which, of course, for, for safety makes a lot of sense. But yep. what if with pairing computer vision and, and having that across the factory floor, being able to predict when someone is potentially walking into um, one of those unsafe zones, either slowing down the robot or even just pausing it, putting it into a safe place, but then um, knowing when that person passes out of that unsafe zone and, and restarting the process. That's going to have not only, um, you know, fantastic uh, worker safety implications, but additionally um, increase the, the operation efficiency of a factory as well. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really valid point. That thinking beyond the the on off kind of mentality of, of of emergency stop, actually starting to build to that predictive, you know, further down that chain. I think that's a really interesting point. That I um, I do agree with you. I think vision really enables that um, okay. rather than your, your your standard PIR type sensors and so on and so forth, which all have their place still. And I think that's one of the exciting things that we have with the Internet of Things. That when you start to really build out and start to connect multiple sensors and machines and, and really start to enable that flow of data um, in real time to uh, effectively work. Um, I think that's really a, a key point. Um, just checking here, we've got... Um, <laughs> I'm just uh, sorry. I was just checking the comments there, but it's um, a lot of comments for Raymond about uh, neural sticks. <laughs> um, Raymond, I'll pass those on to you after this. Um, uh, Ankit, if if you'd like to uh, message through um, the um, Hacker Earth website, um, Raymond will respond to you through there if he hasn't already, um, or on Twitter. Um, Sorry, Raymond, you're, we can't hear you. Oh, yeah. I just want to make sure I don't have echo. Uh, yeah, I will go back to the Hacker Earth, and then I will answer questions from there. So make sure you post it there. Because Twitter, we have a lot of people coming in, so I may miss your comments from time to time. Yeah, exactly. So the forum is actually monitor. Yeah, exactly. So, Bridget, you're, 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 you're very kindly um, uh, one of the uh, judges on the hack. Thank you very much for, for doing that. What, what are you excited to see from, from the community that we're building out here? Ooh, innovation, um, things that solve real world problems that we're seeing. And I, I think we've, we've seen some great examples of that today. Um, and as, as much data to be able to show that it's useful, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that, you know, we've got 500 plus um, registrations. We've already got nine submissions. Um, this is a really exciting time for us. We're, we're really keen to enable um, everybody that's submitting and taking part, we're really keen to read what you've got. And just to reiterate that um, the winners hold their IP. Um, you know, you win $10,000. Um, you win a number of products along the way as well with Neural Sticks, Fizzy, and you'll also have the direct support with the mentors. Um, but we'll also, AD Link, and with support from Intel as well, we'll help you go to market and validate um, that, that winning prize as well. Um, so, you know, it's a really exciting opportunity. Raymond and I were chatting. Um, last week about our experiences of working for and with startups um, and the burnout phase quite often of, hey, this is a great idea. You then doing your day job, trying to validate to the market. If you if you really push forward and push hard and hard and hard, you, you sometimes strike lucky and validate quite quickly. But sometimes it's that burnout point 
for personal circumstances or anything that you know that that's sometimes the killer of some of the greatest innovation mm-hmm. um Ruben, I, yeah. I know you've got some experiences there Paul and I, I think we should do a series on how how many failure products, how many failure prototypes we did, and how many bad things we have done before one thing works. It was a very painful process, especially back to the old days when I built AI tools. I'm the first, yeah. right? The worst moment you go on Stack Overflow, search for a problem. Oh, you're the first to answer this. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> that was my moment of life. It's like, oh, this is not good. But been through a lot of that when you do innovations. So actually that's my question almost for Daniel uh, from AD Link. Like when you release your um, Barco, your AI vision to track the packages, how long does it take you? Like from the moment from the idea to release, right? I, I think it's already in the market right now, am I right? Yeah, so so the smart palette solution that I described and, and you saw a quick video on is uh, right now available as a, what we call a smart solution. Uh, what uh, Intel may call uh, an RRK. Uh, so if you were to buy that right now, uh, the amount of time that it would take to get it running is really dependent on how fast you can get folks uh, on ladders uh, to mount the camera uh, and drop cables. Uh, there's some configuration, uh, some tuning that would need to be done based on your environment. Uh, and then I'll also, the, the system is all self-contained on one smart camera. So uh, it has several things going on at the same time, not just the machine vision part, but it's also connected to your backend system, pulling the order to compare the order to what it sees and the, and, uh, the correctness there. Uh, so with the smart solution or the ROK, we can get uh, you know, to a pilot where we're actually doing things correctly within just a few weeks. Again, dependent on how fast you can get uh, an engineer on a ladder to drop cables and mount the mm-hmm. camera. Leading up to the smart solution, however, you know we we went through some serious growing pains. Um, what I will say is this: the the machine vision part isn't actually the most difficult part. Okay, and and a lot of folks might find that a bit strange. It took longer to figure out the right lens and lighting combinations to actually read uh, one inch or half inch barcodes from 14 feet away and seven feet away without moving the camera. It took longer to uh, figure out how to uh, not overwhelm their backend system as we were pulling orders. It took longer to come up with uh, minor changes to the the client's uh, standard operating procedures going from hand scanning to no hand scanning. Uh, So those are the things that, you know, I think we often overlook. We we can come up with thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of examples where uh, uh, computer vision can solve a problem. Uh, But we there are a lot of different aspects that we overlook, uh, some of which I just mentioned. I felt the pain. I felt all the bit of it. I feel so. I built a. I built a augmented reality headset at one point. The lens almost killed me. That was so expensive. <laughs> I've to source it. I've to test it. The, all the aberration problem. All the fall off. It was ridiculously hard. And the few to few was too short at the end when I finished. I don't want to yeah. tell all the bad news. It's hard, guys. So get ready. Yeah. Everything hardware is hard. All right. Keep going. Yeah. And, and th- so with this hack, you know. Um, with with the phase two winners, the receiver Visi AI, we're giving them an awful lot of kit there to 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 really get started, as well as the support um, directly from um, Intel, uh, the OpenVINO team, and the AD Link engineering team as well, um, to just make sure that you you have the right support and resource to uh, to succeed on that. Um, Raymond, do you want to touch on a little bit about how they can win the neural stick? All right. Yes. So I'll follow up on the last one and the neural stick. That's why I'm the mentor for this hack. I think there will be a lot of value from my prior experience from other people. I know you will hear a lot of good news about how well it works. Trust me, when it doesn't work, you want to find someone and I'll be there for you. Uh, then the Neuristic is a good example uh, where you can learn how to run the AI the engine. I'll say the easy part right now because you can learn the tutorial by going to our last tutorial uh, video. I'll show you a link where you run it uh, and then you have to do one task. First, you run it with the link. So you basically run the library, download OpenFINO and everything. You test it. Then you want to change one image. The image is like the, your favorite one. So you can do cat and dogs, but surprise me, please. Then once you run the Bananas. engine again with your own image, 
show me what you got on the social media and then share it to the world. Uh, we have instruction already and then read through it. Once you show it to the world, now you enter your information to the form and you will have the chance to win the stick as long as the first hundred. Guys, time limited. The first, Only the first hundred will win the stick. Brilliant. Thanks, Raymond. So uh, let's just have a, a little bit of a, a reminder of what the prizes are uh, for the hack. As you heard from Raymond, you have the opportunity of winning an Intel Neural Stick 2. Once you register on the 2020 Vision Hack page on Hacker Earth, you will receive an email with all the details on how to apply for your Intel Neural Stick 2. There are 100 to be won, so grab them while you can. Phase 1 winners will receive an AD Link Busy AI Developer Kit, which is a bundle of powerful hardware and software to build your prototype with. The hardware is a Smart 2 board, which is industrial ready. It has a 4GB RAM, an Intel Atom 3940 CPU, and an Intel Myriad X VPU, so plenty of power for AI vision. The Visi AI also has very intuitive software included with it the AD Link Edge platform, which has vision tools, and OpenVINO and Node-RED included. As a Phase 2 team member, you will also receive direct support from Intel and ADLink whilst you develop your prototype, so don't worry about support. The final prize. The winning team will win a cash prize of $10,000, but we don't stop there. An amazing opportunity to collaborate with ADLink to validate the prototype with the market. That will include support and create marketing material like a press release, a promo video, a use case, a solution brief, and the support with organizing meetings to validate your prototype with the market. This gives you a great foundation to really push forward and making an impact with your prototype. I think you agree this prize could be life-changing for you and your team, so good luck. So there you go, there, there you have the prizes. Um, Okay, so I think that just leaves us. We're just overrunning by two minutes there, but to say a thank you to uh, Mr. Collins, thank you very much. Bridget Martin, thank you very much for being a judge. Daniel Holmland, thank you. And of course, my co-host, Raymond Lowe. And that's it from us tonight. Uh, tomorrow, I will be uh, talking about giving an overview on um, our uh, AD Link Edge platform. I'm uh, just giving you a little taste of that for about 10, 15 minutes before we then go into depth um, from January. We also have the Nest uh, Industry Insights on January 5th um, with our colleagues from AD Link and Intel. Bridget, Daniel, Daniel, Raymond, thanks very much and good night. Thank you.